So as a special edition of China Tech Talk, we're actually going to uh, be uh, giving you an episode from the most recent edition of the TechNode Podcast Network, and that is China Tech Investors, uh, hosted by uh, Elliot Zagman, a regular contributor to TechNode.com, as well as James Hull, a um, professional investor uh, and who's been working in both of them have been working and living in China for quite quite some time um, and looking at uh, the stock markets from from a from a Chinese perspective and in, in, in particular uh, the stocks the public listed stocks of Chinese companies that are listed abroad uh, so you know jd.com uh, Tencent Alibaba Xiaomi and so on and so on and what I what I really like about their format is that they break it up into two very distinct sections. Uh, each episode is them talking about their watch list or uh, a relevant topic to the watch list and how it's affecting uh, Chinese Chinese stocks. And then they also um, have an interview with with uh, with an expert. And in this case, they're talking with um, Christopher Balding, uh, who is um, who's a commentary writer for uh, Bloomberg. And they're looking in particular at the trade war, um, the um, the relationship between. China and the United States and how that's affecting uh, Chinese stocks. So I hope you enjoy it. And if you do enjoy it, you can uh, check out their show. The link is in the show notes. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the China Tech Investor Podcast, powered by TechNote, seeking truth from facts when it comes to Chinese tech stocks and IPOs. I'm Elliot Zagman, and with me is my co-host, the chairman of our podcast, Communist Party Committee, James Hull. <laughs> uh, what? <laughs> chairman James, how you doing today? Um... Chairman James, it's got a nice ring to it. Um, <laughs> doing well. That's good. He's not really it's nice and windy today in Beijing. It's um, let's see, it's December third. Um, Monday. and uh, you know maybe this time I'll do our disclaimer. Um, you know everyone should know. First of all, I'm not a party committee um, member. And also, uh, nothing said on this podcast should be construed as investment advice or a solicitation of services. Even our numbers may be incorrect, okay? So double check everything. Uh, investing is risky. Speak with your financial advisor and do your own research before making investment decisions. Yes, yeah, so we are some incredible podcast hosts. And by incredible, we mean that we are not credible. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, just keep that in mind. But anyways, uh, big meeting uh, in Argentina uh, over the weekend. So, James, how do you like your steak? I like my steak medium rare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think if I, I kept hearing about the, uh, you know, the the steak in Malbec that uh, she and Trump and their entourages were served. And, uh, yeah, it definitely made me hungry. Um, although... Trump is known for liking his steaks well done, eating them with ketchup, and not drinking. Oh my god! Right, which means he he's, and he likes diet coke. He drinks like a gazillion diet cokes a day, apparently. Uh, so not sure if that's healthy. Yes, it's not healthy. Um, <laughs> but I don't think I don't think we can accuse Trump of. Uh, you know, I, I don't think most of what Trump is doing is very healthy. Uh, but. I think so. If you can imagine, so Trump's Argentine Argentine steaks, well done, with Diet Coke instead of the Malbec. Yeah. So so <laughs> this could be and ketchup. It's exactly with ketchup. So th this is what it it could be the best meal that anyone would have in their lives. Is what it sounds like to me. I love steak. I like Malbec, and. Uh, <laughs> And Trump is going to have it with Diet Coke, well done with ketchup. So um, I think that's wow. an impeachable offense as it is. Uh, <laughs> forget any of the Russia investigation. Um, anyways, <laughs> do, do, it's a do, do you have any, any takeaways from what you heard uh, from the from the um, I guess the only takeaway I'd, I'd say is that um, you know there there was no joint statement that came out of the meeting, and I think. 
you know, I uh, I live in China and uh, I, I look at the Chinese press and I look at the U.S. press and you can see there is some stark differences. Uh, I think some people were sending some stuff out on Twitter. We were discussing this in our WeChat group. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting. One, you know, the U.S. talks about there's a 90 day pause uh, and or delay in the escalation and there's no mention of that in the Chinese press. The US talks about fentanyl. It's not mentioned by the Chinese press. Um, and then I think the Chinese press even mentioned some things that weren't mentioned by the US press that uh, you know all of the the tariffs would go away or be negotiated away. Anyway, um, I think this is the problem. When you don't have a joint statement, you get these types of mixed messaging after the event. And uh, I think next time, I hope that they at least agree on a joint statement. Yeah, well, the market responded fairly positively, at least uh, of now, which is on December, which is around noon on December 3rd. Um, but yeah, yeah, we're going to have. Um, Chris Balding from Bloomberg on to talk with us uh, a little bit more about that later on this episode. Uh, we're also going to be discussing uh, cash burn and uh, the companies on our watch, where, how much the companies on our watch list are burning cash. And first, though, we're going to talk about uh, some news that came out last week, and that's that Jack Ma is a communist party member and that's why i said that uh, james is our <laughs> is our podcast party committee chairman um but yeah it, it's not i mean it wasn't any it wasn't a big surprise to me it isn't a big surprise to i think most people who are you know who follow you know china and, and chinese business issues but it did I, I saw that bill bishop had tweeted out a very uh, interesting question and um you know shout out to bill bishop uh he said that you know it does it does sure. raise some questions about investors or what that investors should have about Jack Ma and whether or not this is a, an issue with disclosure that should have been disclosed at, at their IPO or uh, if it's an issue with uh, with a, a conflict of interest when it comes to corporate governance. So um, in your mind, how to the best of our knowledge should you know an inv an investor look at the party committees, party members, and their involvement with, you know, private Chinese tech companies. Um, well, I, if I could say one comment on the Jack Ma thing, um, mm -hmm. I guess my question, I mean, this is always a question you should ask uh, whenever you're, you hear something or you hear, um, you know, when, when did he become a party member? Um, did he become a party member when he was younger, or is this a more recent thing? And I, I think the disclosure that's come out is just says he is a party member, and it, you don't know when that happened. Um, so I think that's that's the first thing. Uh, and I just totally dodged your question. What was it again? <laughs> so if if you are an investor um, that you know is invested in Alibaba or invested in any other of, of these companies. Um, you know, they all have party committees. They all have, you know, if you look at, you know, you see these, these images coming out of, of, of Tencent where they have special rooms for people to study Xi Jinping thought. Um, it, these are publicly listed companies, you know, in New York or in Hong Kong. Um, if I'm an investor and I think that these executives are, are, are acting in my interest or should be, um, can, do you think that how should I how should I as an investor view the relationship of my managers with a party? So on some level, I think this is a cultural thing. Um, and I don't want to say that as a cop out, more of kind of trying to be respectful. Um, you know, if you're a Democrat and you work with a bunch of Republicans, you might feel uncomfortable. Um, but hopefully you won't be fired over that. <laughs> Um, and also another perspective kind of on the U.S. side to create a parallel uh, is, you know, a CEO who is a major Republican donor, uh, his company will probably get favorable treatment with the Republican administration or Congress or Senate. Um, but that's a different kind of parallel, right? That's a uh, it's the reverse, right? So the 
uh, the company would be influencing uh, the state. And in China, it's the opposite. The state, um, at least in how kind of we think about this right now, would be influencing the company. Now, I have a lot of questions about this. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get to all of them. Uh, but, you know, some of the questions are, how do we define a party uh, member committee? Um, what, who's in it? How often do they meet? What kind of things do they do in their meetings? Uh, this, I mean, a lot of this isn't clear. It's not open. It's not openly disclosed or discussed in China, really. Um, so, yeah, I think that's adding to some of the, the concerns. Um, now, obviously, uh, a relationship with government could be uh, negative, but I think it could also be a positive. Um, and so there is, you know, it is a very not simple, easy, this is a complex topic. There's nuance here. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think a lot of it, yeah, a lot of it is cultural, um, but I think what is also cultural is our entire system of global finance and corporate governance um, that our system is built upon a, you know, a, a free market system that is dominated by the U.S. and, and European systems. And, um, and the, the assumptions that we have on that are very different from the assumptions that we have in the state controlled system out of China um, and there are some incompatibilities there so uh, we're gonna talk about that a little bit more with Chris Balding I mm -hmm. mean let let hold on with there's that's also very I mean these are these are deep uh, questions that uh, basically all of all of uh, any society has to wrestle with I think um, in the US if you said you know uh, return to shareholders is the absolute mm. most important thing. Even that is seeing a change to, you know, this idea of like a triple mm. bottom line, uh, taking a, a better, more holistic view of corporate social responsibility, um, you know, and, and kind of uh, leaders really thinking more deeply about what their goals are of their company and how it fits in with society and, you uh, you know how it's adding value to yeah to society yeah. right yeah. so it's not i mean it's not this it's not black and white i i personally think uh, yeah and, and 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 every company is you know has their own corporate values um in china a lot of times the you know, the party is baked in with corporate social responsibility and also i mean every company has to be compliant with local regulations and i think that you know, party involvement it has something to do with that as well. So, yeah, it's something that you know we're going to talk w with Chris Balding more about that later on in this episode. Um, but yeah, it's something that I don't even entirely have my mind wrapped around, and it's something that is is very difficult to understand. I think even for for those of us who've been in China for a while, um, but it is something that I think it's important to know, is important to to be fully understanding uh, when it comes to or at least to understand as much as you can when it comes to uh, to knowing what you're getting yourself into if you are investing in a Chinese company and that some of those expectations and some of those standards might be different than if you're investing in, for example, a company in the US. Um, but next, let's move on to... Hey, hey James, do you, do you smell something burning? <laughs> I Yeah, it smells like... Um, papery electrons, maybe. Uh, I don't, it smells yeah, like some, smells like cash. It smells like <laughs> cash burning, James. Okay, <laughs> nice segue. I like that. Um, yeah, the cash is burning. Um, so we're gonna talk about cash burn, the cash burn rate, or xiao qian lu. Um, this is basically what, what is cash burn? It's basically uh, an amount a company. Uh, amount of cash a company spends in a given period netted off by their income and uh, revenue. So basically it's it's your free cash flow. It's kind of the way I look at it. Um, so I've taken the went to the pleasure of 
calculating the cash burn rate for four companies on our watch list and I'm going to go through each one. Unfortunately, it's kind of this a podcast is probably the worst uh, way to do this. This would be better with a video. So I'm probably going to, when this gets released, I'm going to uh, post this uh, Excel file to my Twitter feed somehow and people can check my numbers. You probably add a link to the um, show notes too. Take a look at what I did. Yeah, and we'll add a link in the show notes. That's a great idea. Okay. So I'm going to start with IGE. Just going to dive right in. All these numbers um, are from IGE's reports. We're, you know, seeking truth from numbers today. Um, so looking at their cash burn, you know, you look at, I, I looked, a simple quick way to do this is you just take cash from operations and you subtract out CapEx. And so for IGE, I include in CapEx and management of IGE probably may disagree with me. Um, and you might disagree with me as a listener, and you have to make your own decisions as an analyst. Um, I include acquisition of fixed assets, acquisitions of intangible assets, and acquisitions of licensed copyrights, okay? Um, and so when you use all these three for years, for 2015, 2016, and 2017, um, the respective cash burn is 1.8 billion, 3.1 billion, and 6.2 billion. And I also went ahead and looked at the nine month uh, cash burn rate. And here it's a little more complicated. Um, uh, Baidu and IGE in Q3 of this year decided to start uh, publishing their free cash flow, um, which was quite nice. Uh, that's found on Baidu's filings, not on IGE's. Um, but they don't have Q1 of 2018, so I have to use the kind of, I have to calculate everything here on my own. Um, but I'm getting, for the nine months, I'm getting 5.8 billion cash burn. Um, and so I think, you know, they're, they're probably, I, my guess is they would exclude licensed copyrights. And if you do that, um, they're not burning cash. Uh, they're cash flow positive. So it's a pretty big difference. You know, think about that hard if you want to, uh, if you're analyzing and looking at IGE, you might make a different decision. Um, okay, so turning to Pinduoduo. Um, Pinduoduo also complicated uh, unfortunately but if you look at they do announce cash from operations so they started in 2016 I think and they had cash from operations of 880 million and in 2017 it was uh, 315 million now their acquisition of fixed assets was only 2 million and 9 million in 2016 and 2017. So that's basically positive cash free cash flow. No problem there, right? Uh, but hold on a second. There's these items in their working capital called uh, payables to merchants and merchant deposits. So this is cash that technically goes through their system. It goes through their company. They report it on their balance sheet, okay? but it is cash that is restricted. They're not allowed to use it for anything. So when I'm looking at cash burn, I want to look I want to include cash that the company can use and exclude cash that so the, the so the, 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 the so they're they're technically that kind of like sense, a right? like a like a like a bank in this area like basically where where they're just they're just holding their vendors yeah, or yeah. their merchants uh, money for them in essence. It, well so okay this is so actually in order to I was had the same question and in order to get the answer I had to go look into their revenue recognition um, uh, process and basically what they do is they receive upfront payments from merchants uh, that are recorded as customer advances and then they charge for advertising and placement in the feed they charge on a cost per click basis and so whenever a user clicks, that customer advance amount get, turns into revenue. Now there's another thing. 
remember they're selling uh they have a gmv right and they're selling products on their platform for these merchants right and so the merchants um they get they sell and they get paid the majority of the money that the user buy uh the customer pays goes to the merchant and then some small percent I think in the last episode we talked about is about 2.5 percent ends up going to revenue for Pinduoduo right so the rest of that GMV amount um, goes to the merchants but it doesn't go to the merchants immediately uh, and the merchants I think can choose to leave it uh, as a deposit on Pinduoduo's accounts, and they might have some benefits for doing that. I, I actually don't know. I'm just guessing. Um, but anyway, so then, you know, they uh, it ends up showing up on their balance sheet as payables to the merchants or merchant deposits. Anyway, so these are things they can't use. And then looking at 2016 and 2017, taking the numbers from the working capital line on their cash flow, and subtracting these out, we get a, a cash burn rate of in 2016 uh, 434 million RMB. These are all RMB, um, and in 2017 603 million cash burn. Now, I tried to do the nine months 20, 2018, and it was pretty difficult. And this is because on a quarterly basis, uh, they do not report a. Um, cash flow statement which is mm. uh, they're totally in their right to do that they're a foreign filer um, they're the rules with the SEC uh, do not require a cash flow statement um, and so what I did was I used some I made some they, they did show kind of the the consolidated cash flow which is just cash from operations outflows for investing and financing cash flows okay so I just used the, just cash from operations minus outflows for investing, which is a very crude way to do this. It's not accurate at all, um, but it's also showing negative. I, I hesitate to even say the number because it's so negative, but it's 6.07. RMB or million. USD? And there's probably, um, that's RMB. And there's probably in there because they just did an IPO. They probably took some of the cash they got and bought, you know, short-term investments and things like that. And if I wanted to, if I did, if I was a little bit less lazy, I would go in and look at their balance sheet and calculate the changes in the short-term investments. And um, I would subtract that out, net that out of this, and I would get a, a probably a, a lower cash burn rate. But anyway. Um, Let's move on to JD. JD, first of all, I just want to say um, they have very nice disclosure. They don't have to disclose a uh, cash flow statement, and they they don't have to disclose their capex, but they do, and they'd even disclose it on a quarterly basis. It's very very nice uh, for an analyst um, such as myself doing oh, the cool. work here. It makes it a lot easier. Thank you. Um, so JD, uh, actually in 2015, 16, they had a cash burn and that was, uh, in the RMB as well here, uh, all these numbers are RMB, um, you know, 10 billion, 10.2 billion in 2015 and 2.6 billion in 2016 cash burn. But in 2017, things changed and they went cash flow positive, um, to 7.3 billion and but because as we discussed last time the push into JD finance and they are very transparent about this um, they're having now a cash burn of 3.9 uh, for the is that, is that J JD finance period. or JD and logistics they give that they're quarterly pushing into yeah JD, okay, good. Did I I say JD finance clear. I meant JD logistics um, yeah, nice catch. Um, and then the trailing 12 month uh, up to September 30th, it's minus 5.6 billion. Now, JD has, uh, you know, the next step of analysis here would be to look at their cash position and estimate roughly how much longer uh, their cash burn will go and then 
roughly when they start getting low on cash and that's when you'll have an idea of um, you know when they'll either need to raise capital again or not um, I uh, and then let's so anyway I think JD based on what they say uh, at their last earnings call they um, they expect this JD logistics investment to end this year so Q4 probably a negative cash flow again and then next year kind of stabilize at a lower level um, so maybe it's not maybe it's still a cash burn um, but they have plenty of cash to sustain that um, but maybe just not as, as high of a cash burn and then let's move on to Xiaomi um, Xiaomi's also a little bit uh, complicated um, so 2015 16 and 17 we had cash burn no cash burn and then cash burn again um, it looks like for the nine months of this year they're positive but the issue here is that um, when you look at their balance sheet uh, there are other um, uh, the other cash flow adjustments were high okay so what is that that's like the working capital adjustments so Sh Xiaomi does something there they have very nice um, trade I guess trade financing arrangements uh, which give them extra working capital uh, which means basically they pay their suppliers late and they collect um, they I think their collection is they ask for 180 days, which is very, very lenient. So they must be giving their suppliers um, perhaps even longer than that. Um, but anyway, they're able to finance their business uh, with this. It's actually quite nice. Um, but Q4, there may be a big change. I'm only doing nine months here. Um, Q4, there may be a big change uh, with these working capital adjustments, just so the four that I looked at that had the biggest change were uh, prepayments, inventories, which was up about ten billion, uh, prepayments was up about nine billion, trade payables was up about eighteen, uh, eighteen point five billion, and other liabilities um, was up to two point six billion. So the assets right when the assets go up that means mm -hmm. what you get less cash but when the liabilities go up uh, mm -hmm. it means you're not paying out the cash right so you, you get to keep more cash for that period um, so anyway the liabilities went up um, more than the um, assets so they have you know a little little bit extra so so uh, w w when you're looking at this um, this kind of burn okay, where so is the where is the risk coming from with these companies you know is this something that so with with, with four of these companies we're, we're seeing a significant cash burn some worse than the, than the other than others but w where do the risks lie when it comes to this um so I mean, obviously, cash is sort of uh, the it's like the blood of a company, right? It's kind of flows in and flows out. I guess your blood <laughs> doesn't flow out. It's like food, okay, um, for the company. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to elaborate on that, um, but uh, you know, all all companies have a period in which there's cash burning. Um, you know, a lot of startups don't start off day one profitable it's pretty rare um, and a lot of the really amazing big startups that need to carve out a significant advantage have to do it with a significant amount of cash burn this is this is a well accepted thing in venture capital I mean to the point where and I don't know that they do this anymore but there were points where VCs would force their investees to spend their the money they gave them in order to grow faster. So it's like if they're not spending it, they're at a certain rate, then they're not going to be able to grow 
at a certain rate, and some competitors. And we're seeing this to extremes to, uh, with with companies know, like uh, like DD, like Uber, um, uh, Meituan Dianping. Yeah. Bingo. Yeah, Uber is still burning cash. I think. I mean, you know, they they did a debt financing, and and I didn't read the actual documents, but I read uh, some people talking about them, and I think they were burning. Uh, significance amount I, I forget I think it was six months half a billion dollars maybe or something like that um, that's pretty significant um, that's probably that also probably wrong okay so there was another number you should check yourself <laughs> um, yeah so cash burn so usually what happens that the typical company will will be um, have negative earnings right and then uh, earnings will event, so at some point go positive as efficiencies are kind of found and um, and then eventually cash flow will go positive as well but then it'll stop going positive once the company has reached kind of maturity you know there's a life cycle to almost all businesses I mean, all businesses have a life cycle um, you know where they're in a high growth kind of early stage uh, and then they kind of slow down, growth slows down, and then they mature for a while where you have kind of stabilized uh, margins um, and earnings, and then things kind of trail off. And sometimes it can trail off fairly quickly, and sometimes it takes a lot longer. Um, but for startups, mm -hmm. there's this cool no, concept not. called the J-curve. Are you familiar with this? So uh, basically, like, you know, you start the it's the J. It's like you mm. imagine a uh, X and Y axis starting at at zero zero, and then it, the J kind of goes downward to the right, and then eventually kind of flattens out a little bit and starts going upward, kind of forming the a, sh a shape of a J, um, and then below zero is mm. burning uh, cash or spending more than they're making in, in revenue. And then as, it's, as it starts to flatten out and kind of turn that, uh, so start to lower the amount that they're losing or burning, uh, then it kind of rocket ships into profitability. Um, so if we're, if we're looking the, at the this, goal. if we're saying that a, a um, healthy tech company is going to follow this J curve, right, where they start by they start by burning money and they curve back around and they, you know, kind of skyrocket. Um, who is following that trajectory healthily and who is not following that trajectory healthily? Yeah, I, I mean, I I think on some okay. So you got to kind of clear. We got to. It's it's not. This is one metric, one piece of a way to look at a company, and it's definitely not holistic. And you want to be holistic when you look at these companies. Um, but if I had to just look at it from that that way, I would say you know Xiaomi is looking of these four is looking pretty good. JD it looks very good. Um, and part of that's because uh, they just, you know, they're kind of past, I think they're uh, like past the, um, mm. I think they're past the zero line on the J curve. You know, I think they're kind of, they moved up, but they have so much cash. They are in a highly competitive industry. There's Pinduoduo coming up behind them. Uh, there's Alibaba. I mean, they have to spend their. They have to keep growing, and they have to keep uh, hand on their their competitive moat, or or build. Or I mean, they're building a new one. They're building the logistics, um, and so even like even inside a company, there'll be projects that are earlier on mm. the J curve, right, than the actual. So company they they could whole. be. So it's, you know, it's they could have have numerous. So, Projects. Actually, and they they could mean, be going through different spots yeah. of the J curve in different parts of the company at different times. Bingo. Yeah, and then they'll they'll have parts of the company that are profitable that can finance that. Then they might be like IGE, which um, doesn't have that so much, but they have uh, a growing user base. Um, 
people subscribing, they have advertising, um, and they have all these different levers they can kind of pull to, to change their revenues. Uh, but they also just priced um, $650 million now uh, in convertible debt uh, issuance. And that's on top of, I think Baidu did $500 million um, the week or two weeks before. So they're, they're, they're both, uh, and I would suspect a, uh, significant of that $500 million So they're all, they're all, they're all bringing on more debt anyway um, um why, why are they doing this now is this an interest rate thing or right. why do you think that is uh no i think for yeah. ige they need they need uh more capital they want they want to raise the money i mean they did it right before the g20 which is interesting right i mean you probably could have they probably could have waited and maybe gotten a little more if they waited a week, but that would have been taking a kind of a binary risk. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, and IGE, and I think, I mean, def, for, for definitely Baidu is a more conservative company. And I think that that would be the, you know, more conservative decision to, to do it before. Um, and I think that's, that's prudent. I would say that's, that's a prudent decision. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, Another thing about IGE is that you know they do acquire licensed copyrights, and they do have you know if you look at their at their filings, they you if you're looking at if you're analyzing a company from a cash burn, you also want to look at what they're they've committed to spend in the coming years, and I think IGE has committed to you know at least over the next uh, twelve months or one one to two years. Um, not an insignificant amount of, uh, you know, production, uh, licensed copyrights. I mean, all, all these things they they break it out. Um, but you want to you want to take those that future cash spend into mm-hmm. account when you're looking at current and the current trends. You know, so what they've committed to they can't change so much. But what they can change is they can st- they can stop adding to it. Um, and if they're able to do that and still retain users um you know that's that's okay but i think what they want is they want to keep investing in content get more users and have the users kind of i i I mean maybe the right word is graduate or mature or turn into subscribers um, where they don't have to use advertising quite so much um, and then they want to increase the subscription rate I, th- I would I would uh, imagine um, but yeah that's up to them and, and their analysis on how they how the market will best bear um, you know whether it's free ad supported content or mm-hmm. paid content with some ads or so Facebook is there any um, um, this is one that with with Jing Dong it's like something that kind of stands out to me in particular is that uh if their numbers or their subscribers are going down or their 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 users are going down um if they're burning cash and they and they don't have you know their user n- numbers going up they have their stock price going into the toilet um it seems to me like that is bringing on a lot of risk um I mean, their their stock going down, I think, would be reducing risk, uh, from my perspective. Um, Well, I think, you know, if you're gonna if you buy something, if you so you mean from from a from a a shareholder perspective, risk, like if you wanted to buy, okay, right. I mean, if you if you knew you wanted to buy X number of shares, right, and not X amount of capital, but X number of shares. if those shares are at ten and then they go down to five, I mean, you only you spend half the amount of money to buy the same number of shares. It's, I mean, that means you're risking half the money that you would have. But but uh, to be honest, what ends up happening is people think of their investments not in terms of share counts, but in terms of the amount of money they want to put into it, and so they'll still put the same amount of money 
mm-hmm. as they were thinking about putting it in buy at more shares at five, and then you're you're not changing your risk. But on a risk per share basis, you're you're still. You're but as far as the lower. risk that JD themselves as a company is putting themselves into by investing in all this uh, logistics infrastructure, but not you know burning more money. Uh, maybe losing some users so they might not the, their future over the next year might not be you know so hot the 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 um you know the chinese economy is kind of cooling down um i wonder about if the, if they're setting themselves yeah. up for uh a a cash crunch coming up um i mean so you know the First of all, they have, I, I mean, I don't have the balance sheet right in front of me. Um, I could pull it up. But they have a significant amount of cash. Um, they're, when when they say they're spending more, and they're, they're spending a lot, when they say they're spending a lot on, on these, um, uh, on the JD Logistics, I mean, this year, if I just take over the last 12 months, just the negative quarters, um, so Q3 had a positive free cash flow was about 13.1. Just taking that out, you know, they're spending 18.7 uh, billion, right? Now you add, tip, add in that higher uh, free cash flow quarter, 13.1, it goes down to 5.6. Um, and their cash balance, um, you know, is, is pretty high. Um, Let's see, right here I have Q2. This is not uh, the same, but, you know, they had in Q2 52.7 billion. So they could do 5.9, you know, let's say Mm. for 10 years. Um, That's not too bad. (laughs) I wouldn't say that's risky. all right. Anyways, yeah. anything else we gotta we gotta know about uh, about the cash burns of these companies? Um, I think that's it. Any other questions? I mean, I'll, I will make this uh, public, and people can tear it apart and okay. let me know your thoughts. That'd be that'd be really cool. So I can. Uh, Learn All right, we'll we'll do that, and uh, but yeah, but now let's move on to um to our interview with uh, Bloomberg Opinion columnist, Fulbright University of Vietnam professor, uh, and uh, online Twitter provocateur, uh, Chris Balding. So here's our interview with Chris Balding. Joining us today is an associate professor from Fulbright University, Vietnam, also a Bloomberg opinion columnist and statistically proven the only happy person on Twitter, Christopher Balding. Chris, thanks for joining us. Welcome, Chris. Thanks for having me, guys. All right. So uh, the big meeting happened this weekend. We're recording on Monday, uh, the uh, December 3rd. Uh, the big meeting that happened over, uh, you know, steak and Malbec in uh, in Argentina between Trump and Xi has happened and the markets have responded quite positively. Um, so. How should if we are we're an investor if you're if you're thinking about doing business uh, with Chinese companies or investing in Chinese tech companies um, how should we view the the results of this um, this meeting between Trump and Xi? I personally uh, really only view this as a timeout. Uh, really, nothing has, has has been decided or solved. Uh, they just decided to take a timeout on this. Uh, and actually, you mentioned the markets responding favorably. I think the markets actually are uh, their their response. I would interpret their response as uh, relatively tepid. Uh, I'm looking at uh, the, the the Shanghai right now. It's uh, it's under it's up under three percent. Uh, 
uh, and even most of uh, most commodities except for steel rebar are under two uh, percent. Uh, so most everything like uh, deformed steel rebar, the December contract is up five percent, but most everything else uh, is, is up uh, under two percent. Which, especially after they changed the margin contracts yesterday, I would personally uh, interpret that as a relatively tepid response. And I think what uh, what the steel stuff is indicating is the Chinese market is really anticipating a, uh, a big stimulus package announcement, probably in the Central Economic Working Group that's coming up uh, in, in mid-December. Um, and so I think that this is probably being viewed as the precursor to bigger economic announcements coming this month. So we can see that this is happening, um, you know, that this is having that in looking at at you know or in anticipation of stimulus coming up from from China's side, we we could see that this would be good for for example uh, you know construction companies uh, you know natural natural resources. Um, but what about from a tech perspective? How should we look at the possibility of a stimulus uh, coming up in the future? I think the primary where, you know, there's two areas where the tech companies in China um, are really excelling. Um, if, you, if you look at uh, a, a lot of it, especially like in the AI facial recognition type of this stuff, um, those companies are basically getting fat off of security spending all over China, whether it's in Xinjiang or whether it's in Shuzhou. Um, those companies are basically making most of their revenue right now from, uh, from the Chinese government uh, seeking to boost security. Um, the other area where uh, tech companies are making most of their money is in the very retail uh, facing type of companies. Um, and a lot of research recently has been quite worried about uh, Chinese consumer spending. Um, I've seen numbers that depending on how you crunch the data, um, you can get at a, at a consumer spending growth number as, as low as about 2%. Um, so quite different from the headline data that we see, you know, about uh, retail sales are up 9%. Um, and so if there is some type of stimulus pack package, especially in, the, uh, you know, that in how it's going to spill over into tech, I think the areas where you would most likely see that is in uh, additional fiscal spending. Um, fiscal deposits are at uh, quite high levels right now, so I think there, there's a, there's an expectation that there's going to be a big fiscal blowout in the last two months in pre-Chinese New Year, uh, and then how that carries over into people spending more money at Chinese New Year, uh, you know, going out and purchasing cars, which have been down uh, for most of this year. So I think that's how that's how a lot of people are looking at how uh, a, a consumer spending and, and fiscal stimulus package would impact the tech sector. James? Hmm. Um, that, that's super interesting. So um, I guess, uh, you know, can we go back to the G20 a little bit? Um, kind of cover, cover a little more there. Uh, I was wondering, you know, like leading up to this, um, it seems like so there were two views, you know, one was that we'd see kind of a, a big, uh, some kind of big decision or, um, or nothing at all. Um, do you think we'll get, you know, after, after this timeout happens after 90 days or however long it is, um, if it's 90 days from January one or from December one, um, you know, where do you think we'll be? Where do you think, um, wh what do you think the probability is we'll see an end to the trade war or escalation? I think it, my, my, my personal sense is uh, for a number of reasons is that you still have to believe going forward that the baseline scenario is additional escalation. Um, and the primary reason for that is that none of the problems uh, that you know, both sides are talking about uh, were really remotely addressed in in this so-called standstill or timeout uh, agreement. Uh, so they really haven't addressed anything. Um, is is the first part. Um, the 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 second part is is that for many reasons it's 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 very easy to see scenarios where this either provides the impetus to. 
uh, to reach a better con- outcome, conclusion, some type of a- agreement. But you can also spin very easy scenarios where this just lays the groundwork to harden positions um, going forward. And, and let me give you a, a, a couple of examples. One of the key parts of this agreement was that uh, China was going to purchase soybeans. Um, it's very easy to see a scenario where China purchases enough soybeans to clear essentially U.S. farming backlog from the harvest that took place uh, recently. Um, and then the U.S. farmers can plant something different uh, uh, for, for the spring, uh, targeting other markets. And, uh, and, and basically both sides have essentially retrenched their positions. Um, They haven't actually said, okay, how do we deal with these market access issues? Another thing that has, I I think, been overlooked uh, by many people is that over recent months, other countries have taken, uh, maybe not allied themselves with Trump. I don't think that's necessarily accurate, but there has been an increasing recognition internationally that, yes, we should address some of these issues that Trump is raising about China and the WTO. Um, And so Trump would find himself in an enormous amount of trouble, uh, both domestically and internationally, if he uh, uh, reached some type of agreement with China that did not address fundamentally a lot of the market access issues broadly defined that he's he's worried about. Um, uh, Germany has raised these. Australia is increasingly raising these. Um, these these are widespread issues, and so it would be an enormous problem for him to reach some type of agreement that does not incorporate some of the multilateral concerns or com- or countries that have raised these issues. Um, yeah. The other thing is, is that oh, the last thing that, that I'll mention is, is that China uh, is, is seen as an undependable partner in that they do not follow through on their agreements. They do not execute the agreements. So one of the things is, and and we've seen this a number of times already in the Trump administration, is that some type of agreement is reached with China and nothing happens. Um, And so the reason that this matters is, is that the Trump agreement, the the, the, the agreement that Trump and Xi reached uh, is is essentially giving China some low hanging fruit to follow to to follow through on to prove themselves as some type of reliable partner. Mm -hmm. I think based upon all of all of recent history, you have to say that China is not going to follow through on these uh, on these on these uh, on these issues and that this is going to set the agri- set the stage for further escalation. James and I had talked about this a couple of weeks ago uh, on our podcast and that, you know, my, my theory is that I don't know how much China has the ability to change. I don't I think that um, I, I've, I've been influenced by the book uh, End of an Era by Carl Minzner, where he talks about kind of the authoritarian rise in China. Um, And he looks at all of these, um, you know, a a lot of these issues that that we're talking about really when it comes to IP protection is really just rule of law issues. Um, And whether or not, uh, you know, companies, uh, the U.S. government, uh, other countries uh, can rely on on the Chinese legal system to protect, for example, their their international intellectual property. Um, and you look at this history of legal reforms that have been attempted in China over the last 20 to 30 years, and you see that every time that they've attempted them, um, they, they end up you know, bumping up against party control in one way or another, and, and it ends up collapsing. So it's almost as if some of these, these deeper reforms that need to be made, you know, that, that the party may not have the capability, at least under its current leadership, in, in, to do that. So you know, I, I'm a little more pessimistic about the long term because I don't see how – I don't see it in the, the Communist Party's toolbox to make the, the kind of reforms that, that, that the U.S. and many other countries are pushing them to make. So I think one of the issues is, and, and Carl's one of the one of the best China guys out there. Um, but I would really take it in uh, a slightly different direction, in the sense that uh, I think she is taking uh, China in a very very different direction. So whether or not they can change is almost irrelevant because that's not the direction that she is taking them. Um, the entire focus, I think, of of Xi economic policy is much more centralization. Uh, is much more SOE uh, type of uh, influence. 
And I think one of the things that you've seen is uh, even pe a lot of people that aren't necessarily what you would call anti-party or democracy advocates by any stretch of the imagination are worried about uh, the level of state control. You've seen an overwhelming amount of uh, talk recently uh, among Chinese analysts. Uh, you've even seen this become a little bit of a hot button issue politically is how much the Xi administration has been favoring SOEs over the private sector. And so I think uh, even if they want to change, there's there's not necessarily the sense that uh, that uh, they want to change. Uh, and so I think that is concerning to a, a lot of people, uh, both outside of China and inside of China. Yeah, I, I think I, I don't want to speak for Carl Minzner too much um, because he's not here. But I, I think what he what he would say and my kind of my takeaway from from his book was that um, if you are Xi Jinping and you look at the way that reforms have failed, uh, no, or not necessarily failed, that once they've had success, the party the, the party has pushed back because it, they have kind of intruded on some kind of vested interest. That that she has come to the conclusion that the only way to change things is to basically cannibalize the party to to go from this kind of a uh, consensus rule that uh, was not that that had had evolved over you know the the post dung the dung and post dung periods uh, into what we see now as kind of more of a, a standard run of the mill dictatorship um, because there's they have no other option and that um, that she does not see um, li liberalization as as something that is is a viable option that he has seen what has happened with 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 the the USSR and the, the fall of the Soviet Union and he says that if 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 I try to liberalize that's what's going to happen so this is the only thing that he can do I think in his mind. <laughs> Yes, and so so I would agree with that, and I, I think I, I think I think the driving ethos of the entire Xi administration is to that he does not want to go down in history as the uh, as the emperor that oversaw the the end of the CCP in China. I think that is the driving ethos for everything that the Xi administration does, and so I think this idea you you hit the nail on the head comparing it to the Soviet Union. This idea that they're going to liberalize the steel industry and accept some pain along the way to get a more efficient steel industry, I think just d does not fit with the facts. And I think she is going to fight against that uh, with every fiber of his being because he does not want to be the emperor that oversees the end of the CCP. Yeah. I, um, so, you know, if, if we kind of, like when I look at China U.S. relations uh, kind of broadly and I go back to you know, I, I was pretty young in 2001 um, uh, in 2000 and 1999 when the U.S. was talking about letting China into the WTO. Um, but when I read some of these these speeches, I mean, they're basically saying um, they will let China into the WTO because it will change China. And by change China, it's... Uh, that it will help the Chinese people and change the way the government works in China. Um, and so like, I sort of, you know, if you're, if you're a, a person in the government in China, that's like kind of a little bit of a threat. Um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so it's like they, and then sort of later on, the U.S. had this uh, sort of rude awakening, and I think it's happened in the last couple of years, maybe earlier, I don't know, but it's definitely been written about uh, in the last couple of years that, okay, now there was no change. All the things we thought would happen didn't happen. Now what do we do? And so that's kind of like there's this view that there's a reset going on um, in U.S.-China relations and uh, you know, I, it's it's kind of like is um, I'm a little concerned that maybe it's going to be a little harder to happen. I don't think it's going to happen in 90 days. Um, you know, I I think like a full blown if a full blown reset is going on, and we're talking about if the U.S. still wants to have the position that the there needs to be structural changes that end up with government ref like serious government changes um 
I have a feeling those are going to be very hard to get done. Um, yeah. No, and that's that's exactly it. If you were to essentially make a Venn diagram of okay, where's the overlap on on on, on issues here? I think there is fundamentally very very little overlap, um, and so. Um, you know, and I think if you look at what the Trump administration is asking for, uh, you know, from everything we know so far, basically they're asking for verifiable market access reforms. Um, and so one of the reasons, you know, my opinion is, is that they that they settle back on these uh, U.S. exports to China is that those are actually verifiable because nobody trusts China when they say, oh, well, we promise to do something anymore. Um, China has run out of, of, of trust checks that it can cash. Uh, they've run out of the goodwill and no, but nobody believes them anymore. And so I think that is actually making uh, d uh, reaching an agreement very, very hard uh, because they say, well, we promise to do something and nobody believes them anymore. And the other issue is, is that they really don't want to do these things for the issues that we spelled out earlier about Ch uh, Xi basically saying, I'm not going to let uh, the market go that way. I I want to make sure that I don't preside over the over the fall of the CCP. Hmm. So, Chris, it, most of the listeners to this podcast, um, James and myself included, are people who are at least investing or are at least interested in uh, Chinese tech companies that are listed either in Hong Kong or in the United States. So if we're looking over the next 90 days when we're trying to figure out, you know, okay, what is the future of the Chinese economy? Uh, what is the future of, of U.S.-China relations and how is it going to impact uh, these stocks? Um, what will you be looking at going forward um, that, that might change how uh, uh, a shareholder, you know, views their, their positions in these companies? So the first thing that I'm going to be looking at is, uh, is is the Central Economic Working Group Committee, which happens in about two to three weeks. They haven't released uh, the date yet, so we don't know for sure, uh, but it should be within two to three weeks. Um, the broader market, I think, is expecting a, a very significant stimulus package. Um, uh, I think anything less than probably about eight trillion RMB uh, in announcements would be a, a, a pretty significant disappointment. Uh, I think the market's only going to be happy if it's probably upwards of about uh, 12 trillion RMB. Um, and specifically how that impacts tech, uh, tech sectors, I think the two things to look at is where is where is that money going? Um, and specifically, as we kind of talked a little bit about earlier, um, basically all the all the let's say super high tech stuff uh, falls into let's say facial recognition, machine learning, uh, audio visual type of stuff, which is security based. Um, and so governments, if they get a large dollop of money to increase security to go out and spend money, um, you can you can be sure that. That lots of that is going to go into telecommunications, facial recognition, uh, AI, video type of uh, type of hardware and software that allows them to monitor citizens more. Um, Specifically, one of the leading firms in that area is HIK Vision. They're listed in Shanghai. Don't believe they're listed outside uh, of, of that, but you could buy them through the Shanghai Stock Connect. They've actually been beaten down recently, which it would actually uh, make the case if there's a large dollop of new money uh, that they might uh, be worth watching. Um, the second, uh, the second uh, area which would be worth watching is if this is going to uh, spill over into large amounts of new construction employment and things like that, that could have a, a significantly material impact on on wage growth and how much money consumers are having to spend, uh, which would which would drive a lot of the consumer retail facing uh, tech stocks. Um, like Alibaba. One of the other things that uh, I, a lot of the Chinese market is expecting is a significant uh, VAT change uh, heading into uh, 2019 or the uh, post-Chinese New Year holiday. Uh, so that would be another uh, another thing to watch is a lot of the consumer retail based upon the VAT tax and then how much of the stimulus spills over into wages and employment. So, so does that mean that they would they – would, what direction do – what direction are you thinking that the VAT tax is going to go in? How, how, what, what is, in what way will it be reformed and what kind of impact will that have? 
So the, the, the talk is, is that there is in the offing a pretty significant VAT uh, tax. Uh, China has roughly about a 20% VAT tax. I've seen talk in Chinese investment banking circles that it's going to be cut all the way down to, say, high, uh, high single digits. Um, oh, wow. So it's, it's tough to know how big that would be. Um, but that would, uh, that would provide a significant boost to, uh, that would provide a significant boost uh, to Chinese consumption. If that happened, um, and you would expect a lot of the companies like Alibaba, JD, et cetera, uh, to be real beneficiaries of that cut. Okay. And be- before we let you go, you did mention Alibaba, um, and Alibaba is on our watch list, um, as are you know, Tencent, Xiaomi, JD, a lot of these other companies. Um, and I, I know that you have, you know, you've written before about kind of the, the intrusion of the state into the private sector, particularly with tech. Um, and uh, the news came out recently that Jack Ma uh, was a member of the Communist Party. I don't think that this is a big surprise to, to anyone who follows China or Chinese tech. Um, but when it comes to uh, investors looking at the involvement of the party, in corporate governance, um, how should investors who maybe don't understand how things work in China that well, how should they look at the involvement of the party within the companies that they're investing in? So one of the things that I think mo- is the most common uh, is, is one of the most common misunderstandings about China is that in, in, in reality, the power structure is is that the CCP is above the government. Um, and this goes for also uh, uh, private companies, public companies, SOEs, whoever it is, is that if there is a party branch, the party secretary for the company is typically the really the, the, the power center of the company. Um, and this is also why frequently, not always, but in, in, in a fair amount of companies, uh, the, the CEO will be the party secretary for for the company, um, because that is uh, that is essentially the indication of, 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 of influence. And so the reason that this matters is, is that this indicates the, the level of influence that the party has over uh, over companies. Um, they've even created party boards and uh, and uh, a lot of management is putting uh, key decisions through the party uh, party apparatus. Uh, and so this is I, I don't think most people understand how significant this is and how much influence the, the party has over corporate decisions uh, in, in really any any aspect uh, worker contracts all the way through to strategic acquisitions. Um, this is this is really you know, profoundly fundamental to how corporations operate in China in 2018. Well, that's that's concerning. <laughs> yeah. I mean, is this a violation? Do you think just the 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 structure this this structure inherently um is a violation of of fiduciary responsibility? Um, depends on what you, de- depends a little bit on what you mean by fiduciary responsibility. If you're talking, uh, let's say the, you know, for lack of a better term, the financial, uh, corporate, uh, corporate in- incorporation documents, I as the CFO, ha- uh, CEO have a primary responsibility to my shareholders. Yes, I would say it is a violation of fiduciary responsibility. Um, if you are the CEO of a Chinese corporation, um, your fiduciary responsibility is to yourself to stay out of jail. And how you do that is doing what the party says. Um, so I, I, I think, uh, you know, it, a little bit of is depending on what we mean by fiduciary responsibility. And I suspect that most uh, tech investors, whether they're in Hong Kong or New York, will be a little bit surprised that, you know, um, that uh, CEOs have that much of a responsibility or a corporation has that much of a responsibility to the CCP. Okay. So I got to ask, I got to ask a question about this. So what, like what kind of companies get these, um, these party, uh, what do you call them? Teams or groups or boards or sects, committees, committees. So at this point, it's it's pretty much it's pretty much any company of any size. 
Um, if you're a fruit vendor on the side of the road, you probably do not have to form uh, a party committee. Uh, if you are uh, if you are a company with a thousand employees, I would be surprised in China if you did not have uh, if you did not have a party committee. Um, if okay. you will notice, most uh, most every apartment building uh, that you will see in China has the designated party appointee for that apartment building. Um, so if they're doing it for essentially every apartment building in China, you can be assured that they're doing it for co for companies of any uh, of, of any significance. Uh, you know, 20, 25, 50 employees, you probably have a party committee. And then I, I guess the next question would be, um, I think I've heard, uh, you know, like, a, like a, let's say a startup, you know, it's got 100 employees, maybe there'll be like two, I mean, there'll be a party because uh, there are there are regular people in China that are members of the party, right? Um, yes. And then they they'll have like meetings uh, in the comp, you know, on the during company time uh, to handle party business, right? Um, yes. And so, like you know, say there's a hundred employees, maybe five are in the party, and they'll meet together to discuss party business and vote on party related things whatever they are like, like um, if you ever saw the nbc version of the office it's like the party planning committee yes that's right. a, that's exactly <laughs> that's exactly it yes that's the kind of nice fun way to think about it um <laughs> yeah but so i mean from what i've heard is that um i i mean i don't know how fully involved they get into the decision making um but I guess if if the CEO is a party member, then he's obviously there. Um, so then, in the if you've ever read and this book is a couple of years old now, but it's very applicable and probably even more so with this specific anecdote. Um, if you remember the milk scandal case uh, in 2008 with the Olympics, the melanin um, or. Yes, exactly. Um, the CEO of that company, uh, which was doing that, uh, was also was the, the, the party secretary. And the reason that this matters is that she was under orders from the party not to let any scandals hit in the, in the, in the run up to the Olympics. So as this started unfolding, um, the entire the entire focus was is to prevent this from becoming a big issue. Um, and so they covered it up and they covered it up and they covered it up um so you could very clearly see that there was party directives and she was acting upon those directives as a priority over the corporate need to address this issue um and so i think if anything that it's it, it's quite i think the weight of evidence would indicate that that has only become uh more pronounced since then um with everything that has happened so we could probably say that at least with the companies that we follow, there is is at the very least um, an added risk when it comes to issues like um, disclosure. Um, if if there if disclosing information uh, would be harmful to uh, the party's interests, but benefit the interests of shareholders, that they may choose the interests of the party over the shareholders in that situation. Exactly. And, you know, an, another good example of this would be, uh, according to Chinese law, tech companies are required to cooperate with Chinese intelligence when uh, when asked. Um, I don't know of any uh, foreign listed company, foreign listed tech company, uh, Chinese tech company that has disclosed this to shareholders. Uh, I cannot imagine that it would go well with Alibaba if they disclosed in a 10K that, look, we cooperate with Chinese intelligence intelligence whenever they knock on our door. Um, I doubt New York would be very happy with that situation. Um, and there are others that this would probably uh, be problematic with. Um, but again, that is that's what happens when you're a Chinese tech company. Mm. So so for investors, basically what, what we should be saying is that they should be baking this into the price. Um, yes, they absolutely th should be baking it into the price. OK. All right. And just that that it is an added risk that they'll be taking on. Yes, absolutely. All right. Good. James, do you have any other questions for Chris? Um, I think no, that's 
I think that's good. Yeah, we took um, up enough <laughs> enough of Chris's time. We're, we're hitting our deadline of time here. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, well, Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, how can so if uh, if our listeners like what they hear, uh, how can they how can they know more about you? Uh, the the most uh, the most regular one is to uh, is to follow me on uh, Twitter. Uh, that's where I'm uh, typically most active. Okay. And how do they search you? Uh, my Twitter handle is Baldings World, uh, or, uh, you know, the at Baldings World is my Twitter handle. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks, Chris. All right, thank, thank you. you. Well, that just about does it for us today. We want to remind you all that if you enjoy what you're listening to, to give us five stars on iTunes uh, or wherever you get your podcast. Just give us some good ratings. Also, you can uh, you can give us some feedback by uh, hitting us up on Twitter. I'm Elliot Zagman. That's at Elliot Zagman. That's E L L I O T T Z A A G M A N. James, you are James Hull X J A M E S H U L L X. Also, uh, Technode has some very, very, very good uh, newsletters available at their at their site. So technode.com slash newsletters. They have uh, newsletters for everything that uh, that you could want to know about when it comes to to China tech. So hit them up and uh, subscribe to their newsletters. So before we, we sign off, James, what are you looking at this week? Um, so this week there's a company called Mogu Inc. Uh, that is listing, um, I think it's going to be New York Stock Exchange under the symbol M-O-G-U. Um, they are looking at a share price range of 14 to 16. Uh, offer amount is $87 million. Um, they, what do they do? They're kind of like a future fashion sort of concept, um, you know, new retail concept um, that's, I guess, maybe kind of like Pinduoduo in that they go kind of connect the customer to the manufacturer. Um, and uh, yeah, they're timing their IPO after the G20. Uh, we'll see. Let's see how that goes. Yeah, one of a number of companies that we're going to probably see uh, IPOing over the next few weeks uh, before the holidays or right after that that G20 summit. Speaking of, of the G20 summit, Trump will be doing a, a press conference on Thursday the 6th. Um, and we'll probably get a little bit more information from him about his thoughts and his attitudes uh, towards the uh, the meeting that they had with uh, with the Chinese leadership. But uh, yeah, so that that just about does it. So thank you again to Chris Balding for joining us, and also to our producer uh, extraordinaire John Artman. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us on the China Tech Investor Podcast. We'll see you next week.